Welcome to the first ever Machine Learning for Forensic Practitioners short course. This summer 2022 short course is sponsored by NIST. Your speaker today is Dr. Heike Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman earned her PhD in Augsburg, Germany. And since 2002, she's worked as a faculty member at Iowa State University, earning responsibilities and titles of professor in the Department of Statistics, where she currently sits, professor in charge of the data science program, Kingland faculty fellow, American Statistical Association fellow, and the Association for Firearms and Toolmark Examiners technical advisor. In her CSAFE research, she has used a significant amount of machine learning and we'll share some of that with you today. Dr. Hoffman, take it away. Thank you, Anthony. So welcome everybody. Um, this is really exciting to, um, to, do, to kick off this um, three-parter on machine learning. Machine learning is very much at the heart of my everyday work. So I hope that you can take some of this out, some of this away and maybe get some ideas of what you can do in your regular work. So just our disclaimer for, or our thank you um, note at first. This work is partially funded by the Center for Statistics and Application in Forensic Evidence. And that is the, through the cooperative agreement between NIST and Iowa State. And as you all know, we've got other universities as part of that cooperative agreement. This is joint work. Um, this is joint work with Alicia Karikiri, our director of CSAFE, and Jeff Salyards, our technical advisor. And the two of them are hopefully um, sitting somewhere in, in the Q&A and hopefully fielding questions for me during the talk. After the talk, I will go over questions and get back to you um, with a summary. All right, so outline. What are we going to do um, for today? The we want to work a little bit on the big picture. So what is machine learning? What are classifiers? How can we evaluate um, how these classifiers are doing? And then I want to show a couple of examples. Next time we want to go a little bit more technical. Um, so trees, generally algorithms, trees, random forests, neural nets, and then for the third part, I want to go deeper in the actual sense that hopefully I can show off some of our deep neural network activities. It doesn't mean that it's deep and dark, it's um, just convolutional neural networks. So part one, <clears throat> big picture. And um, just in case these slides look familiar to you, that's because Jeff, Alicia and I presented this um, about a decade ago in March, 2020, um, before all of this um, long stuff happened at the AAFS meeting in Anaheim. So big picture. So what is machine learning? Um, <clears throat> machine learning so is when Netflix suggests to you what else you could watch? There's this online <clears throat> retailer that we all know that repeatedly reminds us <clears throat> that we should click on these tailored ads. So click on buying those shoes, finally. Machine learning is also what's going on when our spam filter filters out some messages and we miss yet again, and a chance on getting one more million dollars. It's machine learning is what's going on when our phone helps us to identify butterflies, pictures, plants. Machine learning is also when reCAPTCHA makes us pick out all of the bikes out of a set of pictures. Um, and that looks all like um, cute fun. Um, machine learning is also when our bank makes us aware of potentially fraudulent 
transactions on our credit cards. Sometimes machine learning is the difference between, um, in us getting a loan or getting and qualifying for a particular insurance or not. Machine learning can help doctors make diagnosis, help doctors, surgeons operating. So essentially, machine learning is all around us. And um, just coming back to um, from the, all these high stakes decisions, bottom line is summarized by Google's chief decision scientist, Cassie Kuskoff. Kursakoff, uh, machine learning is essentially just a fancy labeling machine. So what, what does that mean? Labeling in statistical speak, speech is called classification. So we classify some, some observation according to um, our targets. So we've got some labels, um, classes, targets, for example, the spam filter has to decide between this email is spam and belongs to the filter and no, this email is not spam. So um, here, for example, yet another one of these missed opportunities um, to make some money that showed up in my spam filter um, a while ago. And what my spam filter reported was why is this message in spam? It is similar to messages that were identified as spam in the past. So that's an important point, spam in the past. So my spam filter is using some information that has been provided to this filter in the past that helps it to distinguish between what's spam and what is not spam. So we need data. We need this additional data to provide context to um, to, to our classification problem. So <clears throat> what else do we need? Um, we, um, when we have a look at this email, <clears throat> there's a couple of pieces that might um, tell us that this is spam. So for example, if you have a look at um, who this email is from, <clears throat> the email, um, the, the name for the email is not the same name as the email address. Additionally, the email was sent to me as a blind copy. So it's not completely clear to me why, a, why something would be sent as a blind copy if it's actually addressed to me. And then there's these odd things. We are Goldman Sachs investment company. So whenever the grammar is a little bit off, that is a sign that maybe this is a spam email. So we can take all of these pieces and observe these pieces or look for those pieces. So we want to get a set of attributes that help us to distinguish between the different target classes. So in the case of the spam, we want to find, identify some features, um, some attributes of an email that allow us to, dis, to say this is maybe spam or maybe this is not spam. So <clears throat> we need the set of attributes. So, uh, to give other examples more um, in the forensic science domain, um, the length of the thigh bone. Um, if a thigh bone of femur is particularly long, it might be an indication that this bone, um, if it's from a skeleton, that this bone belongs to a male skeleton. Uh, we can have a look at, um, so if we find some last pieces. Um, the lab can evaluate that in a mass spectrometer. Um, and uh, we can say, well, we've got certain elements, X, Y, Z, at certain concentrations. And if those concentrations for these particular elements are particularly high, this might indicate that it's a, a glass from a car. Otherwise, <clears throat> it might be glass from just a window pane. 
So just to, um, to bring home this term terminology, a feature or an attribute <clears throat> is the characteristic of an item or an observation that we want to classify. And we, so the, we want to classify the item. So we observe or we measure this feature to give us additional information about the, this item. So it can, for example, if we've got a white powder, then we might be looking for the concentration of various different chemical compounds to help us distinguish whether this is just powdered sugar or something more malicious. We might be interested in trying to distinguish between professional grade duct tape and um, general purpose duct tape. So we might want to think uh, to measure how thick this polyethylene film is for the duct tape. So, and I've already given away the target classes. So um, usually we measure something that we measure a feature that helps us distinguish be um, between one target class versus the other target class. And I'm going to use um, class, target, and label all um, indistinguishable, um, so exchangeably. So please forgive me, I'm aiming for target class, um, but sometimes I will just say label. Okay, so a um, little bit more terminology. I'm sorry about that, but um, we're working on the basics, right? So we just so that we know what we're all talking about. Label is you is no is, is the known type of an object. So an object is labeled. That means we know the ground truth. Somebody has determined what the ground truth for this object is. And you might ask yourself of what the purpose is for those labels. Um, why would we need an algorithm if we already know ground truth? So it actually works the other way around. We, we provide this information to the algorithm. So we need to provide the algorithm with some information that it can learn from. So that's where these labels come in. If we only have um, two possible outcomes, for example, male or female, or um, the substance is cocaine or not, that is, uh, it, those are examples for a binary classification. So there's only two, one or the other. We also have the possibility that there's more than two possible outcomes. So for example, if we're looking at glass, it could be architectural glass, automotive glass, bottled glass, or any other kinds of glass. When there's more than two possible outcomes, we call this a multi-class classification. So when we're talking about the labels, so the ground truth for a particular object, it can get a little bit tricky. Sometimes an item can belong to multiple classes. So for example, um, if you think about outsole patterns in footwear, and you have a look at the bottom of your shoe, there might be circles on your shoe, there might be some text on your shoe, there might be additional lines or zigzags. So any shoe can have multiple of these elements. So whenever we see that, we would label this, um, this item with multiple labels, and that is then called multi-label classification. So the difference between a binary classification is that an object can only be one or the other, but not both. Once we allow multi-label classification, 
an object can have multiple arguments um, that don't exclude each other. We call the set of calculations that we use to carry out a, a classification, the algorithm. So what we're going to talk about are mainly algorithms that allow us to do some classification. Okay, so <clears throat> when we're in machine learning, we are essentially dealing with two kinds of situations. Um, that depends on whether we have ground truth. So ground truth is known, so we have labels in that case, and our algorithms are using those labels. In that case, the learning, um, the learning algorithm is called supervised. The supervised algorithm learns um, data where we know ground truth. So we have labeled data and the that is the way of telling the algorithm what kind of features relate to um, the labels, to which label. So the algorithm has to decide which features to use for which of the classes in order to provide the most feedback for one over the other class. Okay, so unsupervised algorithms just find features by themselves. That also means that the features might not necessarily be summarizing what we're interested in from the data. Um, so it's a lot less predictable behavior from these algorithms and much more of a black box. But sometimes when we don't have labels, we need to just work with similarities as much as we can. Okay, we are going to focus on supervised learning algorithms. So we're in the situation that um, you can think of this as a spreadsheet. So we have some data. So we have individual items. We've maybe got those IDs. We have additional features. You can really think in terms of spreadsheets. We might have five. We might have 500 features. What is important, we also know ground truth. So we know which label each one of these IDs gets in the end. So this is the situation that we're starting with. The, um, both the data together with the label inform the algorithm. So that's how the algorithm learns. So this is the data that trains the algorithm. And that means uh, we call this the training data set. So when we're thinking in terms of training an algorithm, or this is where the statistical learning comes in. Um, learning means we train a data set, uh, we train an algorithm using this labeled data set that has features and the labels. The algorithm then links the features and the labels. And hopefully, once we've got the algorithm, we can make other predictions. We'll get to that. So let's have a look at some examples. So for example, um, let's get back to the glass fragments. So and as a training data set would be, for example, um, glass fragments from a couple of different manufacturers. So those are the manufacturers that we want to so those are the labels So we want to identify where the glass comes from or who, which manufacturer made those um, glass fragments. And what we measure for each fragment are some concentrations, some chemical concentrations, elemental con concentrations. So those is, that's what we're going to use as the features. A different example, um, we might have um, different opioids and we want to distinguish between 
a couple of different types of opioids, so codeine, fentanyl, morphine. What we know about each one of the samples is some chemical structure. So for example, the log p value, so um, just um, the, the log of the partition value, and then maybe some receptor binding. Again, we've got the label. So we already know the different types. We have features that are easier for us to derive than um, in the lab, um, determining what, um, what opioid we're actually dealing with. So the whole machine learning aspect here is we're trying to make our lives easier. Some evaluations are really hard and we're trying to use information that is already known that's more easily accessible in order to come up with a suggestion of what this could be so that we can check for this particular type of opioid, say, or a particular chemical compound rather than um, doing the whole range of different checks. So the training data with the features connects through the algorithm, um, the, um, it, it uncovers the link between the labels, so the classes and the feature values. So now that we've talked about the training data, the question is how do we actually um, do this connection through the algorithm? So there's a lot of different flavors of different learning algorithms. Um, for example, um, just simple linear classifiers. So for example, an LDA, naive Bayes, or a logistic regression. So we'll be talking a bit about a logistic regression next. Um, there's also decision trees, random forests. So the further down you go in this list, the more heavy, the machine learning component is, so the more computational power we need and the less um, statistical assumptions go in. Um, just in, if you're looking for clustering algorithms, clustering algorithms are actually unsupervised learning algorithms. So they won't show up on this list, um, but if you want to do some clustering, um, let us, let Anthony know, and we can put in something for our third part um, for a deeper dig. So <clears throat> let's have a look at the logistic regression. So logistic regression has the regression in the name. So it's, it's a bit like ordinary regression. Um, but we have only two outcomes. So the outcome is binary. So for example, something like yes, no, male, female, success or failure. Um, so um, we want now to connect the class um, to some of the features that we've measured and determine the probability for, um, for, for that class. So if, for example, what's the probability um, that a powder sample is um, fentanyl, um, given that we know what the log P value for the sample is. So let's have a look at that example a little bit more closely. So um, let's say that we've got 40 samples of some white powdery substance and we assess the partition coefficient for all of them. We get log p values somewhere from 1.8 to almost five. And then we additionally do more tests and we get labels that reveal to us whether these samples are fentanyl or whether they're not fentanyl. So tests, additional tests reveal that 25 of these samples are actually fentanyl. 
So it might be a picture like that. It, the scatter plot shows us we're plotting log p values on the x axis. And on the y axis, we just have two values, no and yes. No is at the bottom. And you can see that all of these lower values of log p are not relate are not samples that turned out to be fentanyl, whereas um, the very high values are all fentanyl. So we we could now draw a line maybe through 3.5 and say, well, everything below 3.5 is um, not fentanyl. Everything above is fentanyl. And essentially that um, drawing these kind of thresholds, that's what a naive Bayes classifier would be doing. Um, we're not going to do that here. Instead, we're going to do a logistic regression. And a logistic regression is based on a probabilistic statement. It captures the odds for success. So in this case, um, let's call this that a sample is fentanyl, a success. I know that's a little bit weird, but um, let's just say we're looking for fentanyl. And when we're finding what we're looking for, that is a success. So um, let's just think of a success as fentanyl is equal to yes. That means that a failure would be um, the sample is not fentanyl. So it doesn't mean whether we're right or wrong with our test, it just means we found fentanyl and we did not find fentanyl. So then um, the odds, what we're looking at uh, are the odds for find uh, the for success would be to look at the probability of success and divide that by the probability of failure. That's what an odds um, that's what, what the odds tells us. So how much more likely is it that something is fentanyl divided by um, the, the value for it or the probability for it being not fentanyl? So this we can run this model in, in any statistical software. So here um, we we find out that alpha is negative 61 and beta is 17.8. So you can see that here the, um, the equation essentially looks like a, line a linear regression. So we've got our intercept alpha plus beta times x, x is log p. And that gives us our y. The y just looks a little bit strange, this log odds. So what we did was we used this data and we learned this link between um, fentanyl, uh, the predictor, uh, or the, the outcome, the probability that something is fentanyl and the predictor, the log p value. So as log p increases, that's the beta here, um, the probability, the odds for something being fentanyl increases as well. So just from the sign in beta, we see that there's a positive relationship and it's a very strong positive relationship because it's such a high value here. Um, there's a strong positive relationship between um, log p and the probability that um, we find fentanyl. So if we now have a new sample for which we know the log p value, we can actually estimate the probability that we have a fentanyl sample. So how does that work? Um, we do some math. So essentially we're solving the equation for the log odds for the probability that um, we have a success. So let's say that we've got 
a sample with a partition coefficient of 3.6. Then we can put that into our um, equation that we got, and we get that the log odds turn out to be negative 61.7 plus 17.8 times the 3.6, which gives us a 2.38 or 2.4. So that means that it's 2.4 times more likely that the sample is fentanyl than the sample not being fentanyl. So that's already a pretty strong indication that the sample is fentanyl. And in order to get to the actual probability out of the odds, um, we just do some um, exponential. So e to the 2.38 divided by 1 plus e to the 2.38. That turns out to be something that's really close to 1. So this can be at most 1. And um, the smallest value would be 0 because we're dealing with probabilities here. So 0.92 is the probability that we are dealing with a fentanyl sample given that the log p value was 3.6. So all this math is um, pretty terrible. So I'm not expecting that you um, do the math in Instead, it's much nicer to let the software do the math for us. So here is the original picture that we had with the blue dots for all of the samples that we got. In black, we're drawing the probability to encounter fentanyl as a function of the partition coefficient log p. So that relationship is this line in black. So if we now um, get a value of 3.6, that's the log p of this new value, um, we draw that in on, along, uh, we, we start in the x-axis and we draw something along um, parallel to the y-axis until we hit the curve. Once we hit the curve, we go parallel to the x-axis and um, we have we look up the value for that particular, um, uh, we look up the probability that's associated with this particular value for log p. And we come up at 0.92 um, or in the picture 0.9 is good enough, right? So <clears throat> that is a relatively easy way to just evaluate the probabilities given the log p value. And like I said, the software is going to draw the line for us. Okay, so um, 0.92, what does that mean? So sometimes it's not good enough to say that um, we have a probability. Um, sometimes we need to actually say, well, this is like this is fentanyl as opposed to this is not fentanyl and as a statistician i really struggle with that i will just say this is very likely fentanyl rather than not but the so in in order to get actual class memberships we need this threshold so in this example for uh, here we might say that everything that is above a probability of 0.5, given the log p value, um, we call that fentanyl. So we just declare this sample to be fentanyl. So it comes with huge warnings on, on this sample. Everything that's um, where the probability is below 0.5, we will say that this is not fentanyl. So we get um, two classes. You can see here the two classes with the two areas. So we've got the line in 0.5. Anything that's below this line, 0.5, um, is declared to not be fentanyl. Everything above that line is 
uh, declared to be fentanyl. And you can see that now we've actually drawn this vertical line um, just under point uh, under 3.5. Anything below that line, we declare it to be not fentanyl. Anything above, we, um, we declare to be fentanyl. So now that we've made these decisive declarations, let's talk about evaluations of our algorithm. So how do we evaluate classifiers? So we have data and we need to talk a bit more about what kind of additional data we need. Um, we need to talk about bias and variance trade-off. And then there's a couple more performance metrics that we should be aware of and some we should actually calculate. Okay, so in terms of data needs, um, what we need is training, validation, and test data. Usually the training data is about 80% or maybe 90% of our whole labeled data. So the training data is there to inform our algorithm. And then we have two other holdout sets. We've got one holdout set called validation data. Um, we usually use the validation data to tune parameters. Um, so when we, um, when we were talking about the logistic regression, um, we, Never mind, we don't have tuning parameters there. Um, sometimes we have tuning parameters, for example, when we're estimating a density, um, the kernel width would be one of those parameters. Um, if we have those parameters, we should keep um, a set of the training data separate and not use it for training in order to tune those parameters. And then we also have another holdout data set called the test data. That is the data that we don't ever touch until the final moment where we do have our algorithm and we want to see how well the algorithm is doing. The test data is used for the final error rate evaluation. So this is what um, is called the test error. So, um, I've been talking already about some errors. So um, you can, um, we have this tension between how well an algorithm performs on the training set and how well it will perform on a new data set that it hasn't seen yet. What we want the algorithm to do is to learn something that's important about the data um, but when we get um, very close to the to the original to the training set, um, we might be getting too close to the data. So we might find out um, some oddities about the training set that cannot be generalized. So we want the training set to find general um, important rules and not make sweeping statements. So um, that's, that's all very hand wavy. Um, the two properties that I'm referring to are called bias and variance. So bias means, or bias captures how well the classifier predicts our um, target classes in the trainings training data set. So a low bias algorithm is going to use a lot of information based on the training data set. So it's going to make very few classification errors based on the training data. When a, an algorithm has a large variance, 
that means that it's reacting a lot to the original, uh, to the training data. Um, we also want the training data. Uh, we also want the classifier to predict well in a new data set. So these, um, these two properties, bias and variance, relate to overfitting and underfitting. So overfitting a model means that we're that our algorithm picks up too many oddities of the training data set and doesn't generalize well. Underfitting the training set means that the, um, that the model is making very sweeping statements that are not particularly useful. Um, for example, the statement, all models are wrong. That is definitely an underfitting of um, all the models. Um, but um, so we don't want to, we don't want our model to make these kind of sweeping statements. So when a model overfits, that means that its bias is very, very low. Um, but it also means that it's likely not particularly good on any data that is not very, very similar to the training data. If a model underfits, it has fairly poor performance on the training data, and it may or may not do well on any other data. So with sweeping statements, we might capture something, but not enough. So what we want is really a Goldilocks situation. We're, we're aiming for this Goldilocks of just right between those very between those two extremes. So just um, a picture of that. So what we want is the right hand side, the very right hand side. Um, overfitting means um, we're following the training data too much. If we're um, following every wiggle, um, our predictions for later are going to be are going to show too much variance. The picture in the middle is one of these sweeping statements where we say, um, as this feature increases, the outcome decreases forever and ever. And you can see that this is not what the data is telling us. Instead, um, when we're just right, you can see that the feature, as the feature increases, the outcome decreases up to a certain point after which any further um, increase of the feature will again increase the outcome. So what in, in this kind of situation, it's very simple to say whether we're in an overfitting or an underfitting model, but generally our models are not going to be that simple. Otherwise we wouldn't need all of these fancy tools. Um, otherwise we could just draw a lot, uh, almost draw a line by hand and work with that. Um, so, but the, the principles are the same. So we can evaluate bias, we can evaluate variance, and we have to evaluate those so that we know whether we are in a situation um, <laughs> that we want to be on the right, so just right, or in any of the other two situations. So the idea is that we want to build a classifier that makes few mistakes when we're in the training set. And we also want to make few mistakes when we're classifying items that haven't been um, seen before. So we want to the, for the classifier to generalize beyond the training data. And in order to evaluate how well the classifier works outside of the immediate training data set, we use the holdout data set that we kept from before. So that's where we use the test data set. 
the important piece is that the test set wasn't used to build the classifier. The classifier has not seen any data, um, any of the test set test data before. Hopefully the test set is not completely different from the training set. So those two should have similarities. And we um, now check the classifier on the test set and see how well the classifier is doing on a test set. What we then do is we run our algorithm, we come up with predictions, um, we compare that to our labels to the actual state. So let's assume that we've got another 40 samples of fentanyl in, uh, not fent fentanyl, uh, four, 40 samples of white powder in our test set. And here we're summarizing how well the algorithm that we um, trained on the other 40 samples from the training set. So here we're looking at how well the algorithm is doing. So you can see here, that we've got a two by two table. We've got the predictions along the, uh, at the top along X. We've got the actual values on Y. So that means that all of these items along the, in the diagonal, so top left and bottom right, those are predicted um, to be the same as they actually are. So um, we've got 21 true positives. So those are 21 samples that were identified to be, that were predicted to be fentanyl and actually are fentanyl. We've got 12 true negatives in the bottom right. So they were predicted to not be fentanyl and actually are not fentanyl. And then we've got um, four and three off-diagonal items, um, four false negatives. So that's where we said that it, they these samples were not fentanyl, but they actually are fentanyl. So it might be dangerous to have these. Um, we tell the lab that they don't need to be careful with these samples because they're not fentanyl, according to our prediction. Um, so um, those might that might be very dangerous, those false negatives. And then we have another set of errors. We've got three false positives, three samples where we said these are fentanyl and they actually were not fentanyl. So they might be handled with caution, um, but um, they, they didn't actually, they might not have been as dangerous as fentanyl. So these four values, true positive, true negative, false positive and false negative are the basis for our evaluation. And from based on those four numbers, we can then calculate a couple of um, other numbers, other evaluation me um, measures. Okay, so two measures that are often used in, in labs or also in the literature are precision and the other one recall. So precision is the proportion of positive predictions that really are positive. So we said that um, something is positive. So something is fentanyl. What's the proportion of those positive statements that actually are positive? So precision is true positives divided by all things that we called positive. Recall is the proportion of true positives that we actually did classify correctly. 
So that's the proportion of true positives um, divided by all um, samples that actually were, that actually are fentanyl. So these two numbers are called precision and recall. And in our example, those are both quite high. So precision is 0.875, recall is 0.84. Um, the problem here is that we can be, we cannot optimize both of these measures at the same time. If we increase precision, so we're more, we're recalling more things we are more certain or we're calling fewer things um, true of fentanyl. Um, so that might increase the number, uh, decrease the number of false positives. And um, so we only call something fentanyl when we're absolutely 100% sure. That means that we lower the standard at <laughs> Now we increase, hang on, which way around is it? It's always confusing. Um, so in order to have fewer predicted um, samples, we only call something fentanyl when we are very, very certain. That is going to increase the precision. And because the false um, positives so we decrease the number of false positives. As we're decreasing the number of false positives, most likely the number of false negatives are going to go up. Um, so that is, um, there's always a fine line between precision and recall. The two of them pull in different directions. So what we should be doing is we should choose a cutoff based on the cost. Um, so what is the cost of a false positive as opposed to a false negative? And here for the fentanyl example, it might not be as costly to have additional, um, to caution to work with those powders rather than have somebody being exposed to fentanyl um, because of a false negative, um, false negative. So then a false positive might not be as costly as a false negative. So that might inform how we choose our cutoff. Um, different performance measure. How accurate is, are we? Um, so we're just counting all of the decisions that went correctly, both positive and negative um, decisions. So that gives us the overall accuracy of our classifier. And that is a, a good, um, a, a useful metric when all of the errors are equally important. So equally costly. Um, if false negative and false positive are equally um, costly, um, we just count how many errors we had and compare that. Oh, no, we, we count how many um, correct statements we made, made. So how many true positives and true negatives we have. And we compare that to the overall number of evaluations that we had. So in, um, in this example here, we've got um, 33 out of 40 correct answers, which gives us a 82.5% accuracy. So we've already seen a few um, metrics and um, other sciences like to refer to accuracy as the amount of um, variance or dispersion in a set of measurements. So that's sometimes that's usually called uh, standard deviation. So that is not the accuracy 
that we're talking about here. Um, so we need to keep those separate. Sometimes people talk about sensitivity and specificity of a test. Sensitivity is the same thing as recall. Specificity is the proportion of correctly predicted negatives. So specificity is the percentage of true negatives given we predicted a negative outcome. Oh. And then um, the statisticians also like to talk about type one error and type two error. Type one error is the false positive rate. So false positive, um, given that uh, we made a prediction, so that's the same as one minus precision. Um, type two error would be one minus specificity. And just in case you're not completely confused yet, um, actually it works both ways. Um, so here is an overview. So one, it's one of those cases where Wikipedia really has a very good answer. Here is a chart that shows a lot of these derivatives and the different ways that different disciplines refer to the same thing. We all start with our original um, two by two table of true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. And then we have derivatives um, up to all the way out here. So you can already see some here, false positive rate. We mentioned that recall, sensitivity, um, true positive rates, all the same. So that helps sometimes when people um, use different metrics and think they're talking about different things. And it turns out that they're actually talking about the same thing and for sure, at least related, th related things. Okay, let's head back to the slides. So <clears throat> let's try to evaluate um, classifiers. Um, a, a popular measure is the rock curve. Rock stands for receiver operator characteristics. So that comes out of the engineering world signaling. And that the rock curves provide us with a graphical display, a graphical summary of the performance of a classifier when we vary which threshold we should use for a cutoff of uh, one class um, over the other class. So what we're plotting on the x-axis is the is sensitivity or a true positive rate. Um, on the y-axis, we plot the false positive rates and we vary um, for, we, we have a set of thresholds starting with um, zero all the way up to one for our cutoffs. So a good classifier um, is, is a curve that um, shoots up in this setup um, very high and then stays high. Um, here's an overview of the situation. So we plot um, false positives on the x-axis, true positives on the y-axis. The difference between A, B, and C is that we increase the threshold. So as the threshold increases from A to C, 
the number of the percent of false positives increases. A has the lowest number of false positives. Um, at the same time, A has the lowest number of true positives. So we want to have true positives and so we want to have a high number of true positives and a low number of false positives. Problem is that as we increase um, the threshold, both of these measures go up. And uh, the perfect curve would be this little blue dot in the top left. So perfect classifier is has a true positive rate of one and a false positive rate of zero. Unfortunately, we are usually not getting that. If we're just guessing randomly, um, we have equal numbers of false positives as false negatives, uh, uh, false positives as true positives. Um, so that is just the diagonal. Anything, any number or any curve that is above this diagonal is a better classifier than random classifier. And the steeper, so the bigger this area under the curve is the better the classifier. So this gives us a way to evaluate the performance of different classifiers. Okay, so we've got um, we've got the basics. Now let's head back to machine learning and forensics. So these learning algorithms are finding more and more their way into forensic science. So for example, when there's skeletal remains, anthropologists can use classifiers and um, um, known measurements from historic skeletons um, to classify skeletal remains according to um, gender, maybe some race. When we've got blood spatter, um, blood spatter analysis might help us to determine the position of the victim. Were they standing? Were they sitting? Um, chemistry tells us about features in the chemical compounds um, so that we might be able to determine whether we've, we're dealing with A, B, or C. Um, opioids, um, to classify opi opioids, for example. Uh, when we've got pattern analysis, we might be dealing with a question of um, the same source. So were these two bullets fired from the same gun? Um, were those two shoe marks, uh, footprints, uh, shoe prints made by the same shoe? Um, do those fingerprints come from the same person or were they left by different people? So um, here's just um, a couple more pictures. So um, generally, what we're trying to do here is we're comparing um, patterns, pictures that were found at a crime scene to um, a situation, uh, to a print that was, um, that came from the suspect. So for example, a latent print on the left and a suspect's fingerprint. Um, similarly here, we've got a, mic a comparison microscope image from two cartridge cases. And we might be dealing with a shoe print from the crime scene and then a very nice looking um, shoe print from, um, from the lab. So when we're dealing with these forensic measurements, 
it, we're often in, in the situation that um, when we have these measurements, they don't really readily lend themselves to our familiar standard statistical analysis. So something like hypothesis testing with confidence intervals or uh, probabilistic models in the background. Instead, what, uh, what we see is we have lots and lots and lots or so. It's a highly multivariate situation. We have not normal, um, the, the features that we derive are not normal. So all of the normal theory is going out. And um, sometimes we're just dealing with images that have many thousands of pixels. And we're trying to make comparisons between those images. So we've got challenges all around. And that's where we, we are going away from um, the standard statistical tools towards more of the machine learning side. So computationally more heavy uh, models. So um, let's do a bit of an example. So here, this is called the MNIST database. So this consists of training data, actually 60,000 images. And you can see those images um, are all digits. So we only have digits between zero and nine. 60,000 um, partially computer generated, partially handwritten images that are all labeled. Additionally, we've got 10,000 images that are labeled and we are using a test set as a holdout. So overall, there's 70,000 images. We use 60,000 to train and another 10,000 to evaluate. So the question that we might answer here, um, because for right now, I just want to stay in a binary situation, so is it a seven or not? So you can have a look at uh, just a couple of these images. The sevens are quite interesting. So there's all everything between something that might look almost like a one to um, something that looks a lot more like a European seven with all the curlies and um, the strike through in the middle. So is it a seven? or not? That's the question that we're asking here. So um, the, the images or the data that we have here in its very raw form is just the matrix. So here we've got a seven and um, the seven is actually drawn in, in a pixelated image of 28 pixels by 28 pixels. So I'm showing the raw data here. So you can see um, we've got values between zero, zero indicates white, 255 indicates as black as can be. Um, it, these two images are, the, the matrix doesn't actually correspond to the image at the top. I um, couldn't quickly enough create the image at the um, from the data. Um, and you can see that um, we've got um, 28 by 28 initial features that we can use um, to disting hopefully distinguish between a seven and anything else. So when you have, as you're looking at this um, seven, there's a lot of places that might not distinguish between anything. So the, the margins of this matrix are most likely always zeros. So um, for example, in this, um, in this top left entry that's called one comma one, um, we see a zero most likely that is always going to be a zero. So that piece of information doesn't help us to distinguish between any of 
the, the letters. Um, so that doesn't help us to distinguish between a seven and not a seven. When we're thinking about how a seven is being drawn as opposed to other numbers, um, maybe we should go somewhere there in the middle of the um, of this image and pick out some of those um, variables. So for example, um, this is actually somewhere along the bottom. So 20, 28 times 28 is 784. So in terms of raw data, we're dealing with 784 variables. If we're trying to put those variables into a logistic regression. Um, all of our statistical um, software packages are going to be extremely unhappy. Um, it needs a lot of memory to calculate a logistic regression for that many variables. And at the same time, the variables, not all of the variables are actually informative. So when there's all zeros, um, we have something called a rank deficiency and logistic models do not like that. So um, we should pick a couple of variables instead of putting all the variables in. And one way to decide on, on variable, on which variables to choose is to just um, plot a variable against the outcome variable. So here we're plotting variable x740 on the x-axis and we draw a histogram. So a histogram means that we're um, just counting how many values are zero. It, it's essentially a bar chart. Um, so um, how many values are zero? How many values are 255? And then some of these values are somewhere in between, but mostly the values are either zero or 255. So either we've got a white pixel or essentially a black pixel. So what you can see here is um, if we're dealing with something that's not a seven, that's the panel on the left-hand side of that image, there is, uh, there are a lot of values that are zero, and there's a very, very small percentage of cases where there are some values that are not zero. For the seven, so overall, we've got a lot fewer sevens than other, than other digits, um, approximately. Um, nine times as many um, because um, the MNIST database shows figures um, approximately uniformly, not quite, um, but approximately. And what we see here is that compared to how many or how few sevens we have overall in the data set, we've got quite a few sevens that actually are not zero. So where the X70, X740 value is not zero. So this variable is going to help us a little bit to, to distinguish between sevens and not sevens. So we can do that with one more variable. So here is a variable um, where you can see that, so variable 433, three, three, that's somewhere in the middle. So you can see that in the middle, there are a lot of numbers that have black values. So black pixels somewhere in that middle, um, about almost half of the, um, Half of all of the observations are black, so um, about uh, almost 15,000 are completely black. Um, close to 20,000 are 
completely white. And then there's a lot of values somewhere in between. For the sevens, however, you can see that this pattern is different. There are um, almost, there's very, very few values that are not zero for the sevens. So a lot fewer values are not zero than for the sevens than for all of the other values. So this would be an indication that if this variable 433 is high, higher than zero, that would be an indication for us that this is likely not going to be a seven. So this is a negative variable. The other one was a positive variable. So we can, we can go through that and you can um, probably see that we're going to have 784 times fun to look at these values. So we need to think about this um, in a different way. This is not going to be sustainable um, after the first five or six variables that we look at. So um, we can talk later about how we actually got to these particular variables. Um, so we're selecting a couple of variables and we're running a logistic regression on this. So you can see that here, um, here's the output from that. And you can see that we've got about 10 variables or so, and um, most of them are highly significant. Um, X379 was not particularly significant. I let that in just to show you that not everything is automatically um, very, very significant. And you can see here what we saw before, variable X740. So that's the last line here is a positive, has a positive prediction, a positive predictive value, um, 433. Um, that's almost at the top there, um, is a negative variable. So if X433 is higher, the likelihood or the probability, the odds, the odds, we're talking about odds, the odds will go down for a, um, for a, an image to be a seven. So you might um, think that this is a lot of work. We could just look at this. And you're absolutely right, except in, in a post office, for example, we want to have an automatic sorter and we want to be able to at least sort by, by zip code. Um, the zip codes are all in approximately the same places. Um, so once we figure out where the zip code is, we just have to figure out the five or nine numbers that go along with the zip code and we've already pre-sorted the mail in a very quick fashion and that's going to help with delivery times. So um, this is essentially what started this project. And uh, how about, how did we do? Um, so the logistic regression here is at the bottom. We are running, we're using the test set um, with a threshold of 0.5 to call something a seven if the predicted value from the logistic regression is higher than that. And you can see that out of the 10,000 cases in the test set, we got a lot of right. So 8,894 non um, sevens were correctly found out. Um, an additional 624 seven, sevens were actually correctly identified. And then we missed 404 um, sevens that we should have found, but we predicted that they weren't sevens. And then there were 78 images that 
were predicted to be sevens that turned out to be not sevens. That overall gives us an error rate of about 500 errors um, over, out of 10,000. So we've got an error rate that's below 5%. That's actually not that terrible. Um, but it's also not really good. So um, just as a sneak peek for next time, here is the output from a random forest. Unlike the logistic regression, the random forest doesn't really care about how many features are included or whether these features are related in any way. What we're doing here is um, we're training on all of the possible features um, to distinguish between something that's a seven and something that's not a seven. And you can see here um, the error rate is one, just over 1%. And out of the 60,000, um, so here we're just looking at the training set. So it's not directly comparable between the training set and uh, between the random forest and the logistic regression. But what we're seeing here is that um, we get about as many errors in 60,000 cases for the random forest as in the logistic regression for just 10,000 cases. So you can already see that the random forest is going to be a lot more powerful and a lot less, um, less work for us because we can just include the features that we've got in the random forest and hope that this random forest is not going to overfit the data too much. We only have 50 trees and we'll talk about that next time. But um, the, the training, uh, the error rate looks quite promising. So I hope that you now want to go ahead and learn more about what random forests are and um, what those trees are that are making the random forest. So that's what we're going to deal with next time. So for right now, um, I'm, I <laughs> underestimated the time, uh, um, no, overestimated the time a little bit that I would take. Um, so what we're going to deal with next time are trees, random forests, and also neural nets. And I'm quite, um, quite certain that we will be deal that we can deal with all three of those. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about are general evaluation. So we can we know now how to evaluate a model. Um, we can compare different classifiers. Um, but one piece that we haven't talked about yet is we also need to evaluate our data and our model within the data. Um, because um, sometimes we might be in a situation like this. So here, for example, um, we are looking at Olympic results for all the gold medalists for the 100 meter sprint of the men going back all the way to 1896. So that was the first modern Olympics and the gold medalist ran just under 12 seconds. And you can see that over the years, um, the performance increased and the time that the gold medalist needed for their gold medal decreased um, by almost um, two seconds. Um, just to point out a couple of these um, special people here, we've got Jesse Owens, 1936, and then Usain Bolt in 2008, 12, and 16. Just running away from the crowd, um, he's the one um, on the very right of that image. Uh, so what can we say about that? Um, 
those are very special people anyways. Um, but what can we say about um, generally the results? Uh, so we can use models to summarize and predict situations. So in this, here we might want to predict model, um, we, we might want to predict the results based on just a, um, a line. So you can see here the time in seconds. Um, we can model that as 11 seconds. So we start 11 point, with 11.1 .1 seconds in the year 1896. And in every year, um, we're subtracting on average 10 milliseconds for each year. And we can see how this is, is going down for the um, over the years. R square is one of those metrics that help us evaluate how good a linear model is. So R square is 0.83 out of one. That's that's a really decent fitting model. And I hope that you agree with me that um, this model is, um, is decent. So now we can use this model uh, to come up with predictions. I hope you saw that. Um, so there is this orange line popping up. Um, and that orange line um, goes out by a decade. So within the next decade, Olympic gold medalists will probably shave off um, another um, tenth of a second. That seems like a realistic prediction to make. Um, but even reasonable models have their limitations. So when we're um, taking this to the extreme, um, we can actually say that by the year um, 3,206, Olympic gold, gold medalists will finish on average two seconds before they start. I'm all in favor of time travel, um, but based on this data, um, we should not make these kind of predictions. And that's obviously um, because sometimes we can take the context of the data out of the model. Um, so our model has a very limited range of data. If we go very far beyond the range of the data, we are going to hit limitations that we're not necessarily seeing because the model itself is just 11.1 .1 minus 0 0.01 times here. Um, it fits well within the data. Um, it's just a mathematical model. Obviously, we can use that to make predictions. Um, but when we're going, when we're using models outside the realm that they were made for and that they were trained on, um, bad things happen. And the problem is that oh, we can, the models will still give us answers because the models, the, the only, um, the only limitations that the models themselves have is math. And just based on calculus, we can come up with these ludicrous predictions that we can easily see and debunk in these situations. Um, but when we don't understand the model and the math behind the model as well, um, we might be running into um, serious issues and um, use the model in a way that they were not intended to be used. So we also need to know about all the limitations that um, each model's, model comes with. Um, so we are going to touch on that next time as well. So for right now, um, thank you very much. Um, there is plenty of time for questions and I'd be happy to turn over to the Q&A now. Um, so first question is, um, do anthropology classifier mean machine vision classifier? Um, uh, I 
I think the answer is yes and yes. Um, I'm quite sure that machine vision can be used to come up with classifiers in anthropology. I'm also quite certain that we can use just plain measurements with um, measured features um, to come up um, with classifiers, um, but we can also use things like LIDAR um, to actually come up with the feature measurements. So in that sense, we might be able to use um, additional help with the measurements to inform classifiers. I'm not sure that I would call that machine vision yet. Um, it's just a different way of um, using a tape measure and using um, even things like, like the cell phone um, ruler instead. But I'm sure that there are machine vision that there are situations in which machine vision could be used for anthropology classifiers. Next question, how reliable are these machine learning algorithms, especially in forensic applications? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I would like to point to that example that I gave much later. Um, every, we can break every algorithm. We just need to try hard enough. And the problem is that sometimes we are breaking algorithms even without not trying to do so, just because we're overestimating its, its applicability in, and use an algorithm in a way that it wasn't meant to use. So we can evaluate reliability of machine learning algorithms just in terms of numbers. So what would be very good is if we had um, a set of base data sets for which we know ground truth and for which we have performance for each algorithm. So something like a data portal with registered algorithms and error rates for these algorithms, I think that would help us a lot more to answer this question. And I agree with Dr. Maxian that um, assessing the re reliability of machine learning algorithms is really crucial before we can go forward and actually use more machine learning algorithms in any kind of high stakes situations. Um, training data set, how much data do you need? Um, um, the statistical answer would probably be more, um, but there are whole disciplines in statistics aiming at making samples small, smaller and getting the most out of small samples by using weights, survey weights to um, give different samples, different, different amounts of weights. I think using these kind of survey techniques, we, we should be able to get more valuable information out of small existing training data. But generally speaking, the amount of data that is available in forensics and publicly available in forensics is both um, enormous amounts of information, uh, in, in enormous amounts in terms of files, but maybe small amounts of um, actually covered, actual coverage in terms of population. When I'm thinking, for example, population mean, um, for example, the 
number of barrels from which um, bullets were fired is extremely small compared to the whole population of firearms available and used in the in just the United States, not talking worldwide. Um, so training data said, how much do we need? Always more, but more in a smart way. And there's good papers um, talking about how to make data more representative of the population that they're supposed to represent. How do we deal with bias in data sets if we're not aware of bias? That's a good question. Um, I'm not completely sure how we would tackle that, except by trying to uncover the bias. Um, if we start with bias data, um, we have pretty much no chance at uncovering the bias. If our training data set is already biased, it um, by training, it will enforce the, the, the training data uh, will inform the algorithm of the status quo. And if the status quo is biased, then we will propagate that bias in into the algorithm as well. And there's a lot of research on fair principles regarding algorithms. And there's a lot of active research coming particularly out of Europe regarding bias in, and fairness in algorithms because Europe has post um, a law regarding machine learning a couple of years ago, I believe it was 2017, that every high stakes situation that affects a citizen of Europe has to be explained by whoever is using the algorithm. So explainability is a huge, part of machine learning, a very active research part. And I'm hoping that by going down the route of explaining the algorithm, we might also have a chance of uncovering any kind of biases that might be in, in the data in, in data sets and then in algorithms. Um, the next question, um, regards um, the prediction. So looking at the last predictive model in respect of the Olympic runners, um, not emphasize a principle of short-term logic and long-term speculation. That's exactly what's going on. Um, we can, um, it has, the, the prediction went so terribly wrong because we went so far outside the the training data. We went a couple thousand years into the future um, without regarding any kind of biological um, limitations that we will encounter. And obviously this, um, in this example, it's quite obvious that this that going so far outside the range of the data is problematic. What we're not, and we see that because we just have one variable, one variable. So we've got year, and then we've got a couple of um, of Olympic results that we are using. So obvious, it's obvious that we're leaving the range of the data. When we are in a huge dimensional space, what happens is that the data become very, very sparse. So you can think of large dimensional space, um, just like the, uh, 
the 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 just like space so our space outer space and stars um there's very very few stars in our universe and um we're not going to encounter that many stars when we just fly with our spaceship in one direction so there's a lot of space that we haven't covered with data as soon as the um the dimensionality of the problem becomes a bit bigger so the um we might not be aware that we've left the realm of our known data and sometimes it's really hard to distinguish between what we know and what we do not know. Um, so we might be in a long-term speculation um, question, or we might be using long-term speculation, so, um, but without being aware of it. So that's why we need to have um, estimates of the variability in, of our model so that um, we can say this this model comes with a lot of variability. So in in a linear regression, um, we would have seen that the model opens up so so wide that um, we know that it's no longer useful. Um, so framing the data and the set parameters, part of the purpose of a model is also to make predictions in unknown situations. So we can completely um, rely on um, just regurgitating what we've seen in the past and say, this is what we've seen in the past and this is what's going to happen in the future. Um, so we can't operate we can't assume that every model operates completely within its own um, ranges we need to allow for the model to go a little bit further and there are good statistical models that allow us to make those small smallish predictions into the future into the outsides of what we know um but um, we need to be able to distinguish between what is small range and what is large range. And a lot of machine learning algorithms just can't do that yet. Okay, and um, I very much love that um, that shout out by James Mate. Did I pronounce that right? Um, to the NCCOE NIST workshop on uh, mitigating AI bias. Thank you, everybody, and I'll, I'm looking forward to seeing you next week, same time. Dr. Hoffman, I want to thank you as well. Thanks for joining us. We hope you have a great day.